Good morning. Um, I'd first like to say thank you very much for having me today to speak. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to meet with you and to share my passion for ECTD. I think between the three speakers this morning, we will touch upon some of the same uh, topics, but hopefully that will help uh, strengthen your understanding of ECTD. So I will be very brief on my relating of ECTD and CTD, and then I will cover the key components of ECTD. Then I'll touch on the implementation process, the tools that are required to do ECTD, ECTD version four, although I might leave that to Jared to cover in a bit more detail, and the benefits of ECTD. So as described, CTD is made up of five key modules. Module one being your regional administrative information, and modules two, three, four, and five follows your ICH specifications and is common across all regions. So today, you're going to hear me use the word specifications quite frequently. We are talking about two sets of specifications. There will be one set. There'll be one set, which is your... So what is ECTD? It's effectively the electronic a presentation of your CTD structure in the format of documents, folders, and naming structure. And there's two specifications. There is your regional specification, and then your specification that covers modules two, three, four, and five. When I say specifications, think of it as a set of rules and conventions that need to be followed. And they will govern almost every aspect of the actual technical ECTD. The primary components of ECTD are a high folder, a high level folder structure, an XML backbone file, which acts as your electronic table of contents to your full dossier, and some electronic navigation aids to support the review. This was touched on in the previous submission. I of, honest, uh, sorry. I frequently get asked when I first work with a new country on ECTD, where does my other stuff go? Where does my extra documents go? Every country, when they're working with CTD, does have the standard CTD content. However, they always want or need some additional supporting information. An example of this might be batch analysis, the certificates of analysis, method validation reports. A lot of these additional requirement documents can actually be mapped into modules generally three, four, or five. It's a good idea to give this careful consideration when you do your first submission and to try to keep it consistent across your applications. Often your health authority can give you some guidance on where they would expect to see this content in their structure. This is actually an activity that is very important to do before you do your first submission. And once you do it once, you can then apply that same template to every submission. This consistency will really help both yourself, but also the evaluators. They'll know where to go in your dossier to find that supporting information each time. So we've been talking about CTD as a collection of documents. I wanted to start at the very simple start of ECTD which is taking those PDF documents and putting them into a common structured folder system. Your very top folder will be an e-identifier number. I say number, but sometimes it can include letters as well. 
Generally, when you are ready to submit your first ECTD, you would approach the agency and request this e-identifier number. It will be unique and it doesn't change from the first time you submit your ECTD. This will be your very top level folder. The next folder will be an ECTD sequence number. This is a sequential four digit number and it often starts with a 0000, zero, zero, zero folder. The next set of folders will map out to your ICH structure. So your modules one, two to five, and within them you will have subfolders to the ICH table of contents. It's important to note that these folders are only present in your sequence folder if you are submitting content. You do not put empty folders into your submission. There is also what is called a UTEL folder. This folder contains important technical information about your ECTD. It tells the XML how to look and how to function. Some regions will also have a request for working documents. This folder often sits just outside your sequence. Some examples of what the agency may require in this folder might be a word version of certain documents. An example of this might be a word version of your labeling product information. Sometimes they may also ask for a copy of your ECTD validation report. Each sequence must be placed under the e-identifier number and most agencies will require that these are submitted in sequential order. Both the company and the agency must have the same folder structures on their computers. This and must not change documents once they've been submitted. This allows for the benefits of life cycling, which I'll talk about in a moment. It allows you to hyperlink and refer back to previously submitted content. Each ECTD sequence contains two XML files and they form the table of contents for your submission. These will be present in the bottom of your sequence folder. There's the index XML. This is your backbone table of contents for your module two to five. The XX, XX means, is usually replaced with the initials of the country who you are submitting to. So for Australia, that's AU, EU, and so on. This will be your regional backbone um, of module one and is located in your module one uh, folder. There's also an index file that I'll reference now, but I will talk about a bit later, which is an overall checksum for the submission. So what I've just shown you on those two slides are what you would expect to see and need to have in your sequences when you submit to the agency. So this is an example, just, excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip of water. This is an example of what an index XML actually looks like. And the best way I can describe it to you is when you open it in Internet Explorer or Google Chrome, it's the most boring looking website you have ever seen. There's no pretty pictures, it's just a series of text that you can then use to navigate your submission. When you open it up in Internet Explorer or a similar browser, you use your back button to return between, navigating between documents and hyperlinks. At the very top of the index XML, There is a hyperlink there to take you to the regional XML. 
So this is where your module one table of contents is. It also contains uh, the envelope. The envelope is information about the submission, very high level description of what's in that sequence. And I'll describe that in a bit more detail later. So returning to part of the um, XML for modules two to five, I wanted to explain what you're seeing in front of you. So black text indicates nodes. These are ICH and regionally specified structures or sections. These cannot be changed by your publisher. You cannot rename them. Um, they are standard text. What you can do for some agencies, add node extensions. These node extensions are little additional sections or granularity that you can add to help group information at the very lowest level of your XML. This is actually on screen that I've got now, an example of where the agency has requested the provision of some batch analysis certificates of analysis. To make it a little clearer for the reviewer, of what is a CTD page versus supporting information, it's sometimes nice and appropriate to add a node extension to group that information. When you go into a section, if you've got you know, three or four CTD pages, but then you've got 20 method validation reports, that's a lot for your evaluator to take in visually. So it's nice sometimes to group that information within your XML. Blue underlined text indicates a hyperlink on your XML. This is how you navigate to the documents that you're submitting as part of your sequence. You click on them, they will bring up the PDF of that section that you've clicked on, and then you can use your back button, if you're an Internet Explorer, to return to the XML. That blue text some of that naming is follows ICH conventions of namings of your section, but there is the opportunity to customise that language and text. So this is where you can add some information. Is it an introduction? In this case, my example, it's an introduction of a new drug product manufacturing site. It helps the evaluator if you give some extra indication on your um, hyperlinking name so that they can see clearly what they're about to click on. This will also be important later when you're using eCTD viewing tools and you're looking at all of your dossier, not just an individual sequence. Green text on the XML represents metadata. And this is used to organise your information in the XML and to help both yourselves and your evaluator to see, um, to identify sets of data within your dossier. Red text indicates the lifecycle operator. Is the document new? Is this a replacement version or are you making a deletion? ECTD has a number of technical terms. One of these is that we call documents leaves commonly. So a document or the leaves can be accessed two ways. You can go into your folder structure and manually open up the PDFs and navigate that way through your submission. However, it's really advisable to go through your XML. And there's two reasons for this. You want to make sure that the correct document has been linked to the correct reference on your XML. The other reason is, it's actually just easier. You, If you go into a folder structure that has 20 or 30 documents, a lot of the file naming will look very similar. So it can actually be difficult to figure out which document you're trying to open. So the XML backbone 
is a much better way to navigate your submission. When you're looking at the documents, the naming of your documents, the file name, is actually determined by ICH and regional specifications. So that will mean that certain elements of that file name cannot be changed. They're generally all lowercase. There is the opportunity to add small variations, amounts of text at the end, but there are file name limits as well to consider. Checksums are a unique identifier used to verify the integrity of a file or data transfer. These are not a unique element to ECTD. However, ECTD uses them um, in the sense that each file in your submission will have a checksum and the overall sequence will have a checksum. So the checksum is a very unique identifying code that sits on each individual document and on your overall sequence. Now this ensures the integrity of that sequence when it's transferred to the agency, but also long term. It's important to note that checksums will change if you update your document. So if um, at Amgen we have a publishing team and a regulatory team, once I've published a submission, if I give that to my regulatory ramp and they have identified a change, they can't simply just replace that document in the ECTD. We then need to re-update um, the checksums to ensure the submission is still valid. So it's very important that post-submission or post-handoff that changes aren't made. Why is it important? because it will result in a validation error and your agency will not accept validation errors. These checksums are really important. They ensure that the files um, are transmitted correctly between the agency. They ensure they aren't altered in the historical archive of both the agency and the company. And it ensures the ability to accurately reference back to previously provided sequences and content. Now, my previous speaker did touch on some of this, and there is something a little different on my slide, and I must correct myself. So the, usually most documents in your submission will be PDF. The ICH specifications require that PDFs are a certain versions between 1.4 and 1.7. Now this is where I am incorrect. The document file size limit, it has updated to 500 megabytes with the ICH. But at this point, no ECGD countries have actually updated their specifications to allow the 500 megabytes. At the moment, traditionally, most of them are at the 200 megabyte limits. But some companies may still have their own limits. Um, there has been times in the past where certain regions have required a much smaller limit than others. The specifications specify about embedded standard fonts Recommended font is Times New Roman 12 point for text and 9 to 10 point font for tables. But I'm going to be a little cheeky. Other fonts are accepted. It's about readability. So quite a few companies will submit with Arial 11 point and generally that is accepted by the agencies. It's more about readability. Can your evaluator read without straining their eyes what the information you're providing in your dossier? This is also a good point to reaffirm the importance of style guides. If you think of a whole marketing application that is going to need to be reviewed by a various assortment of reviewers, it is much easier for them if they see a consistency across the whole submission. Headers and numbers are in the same location on your document. 
the same format of font and font size is used consistently. These sort of things just all add to the ease of reviewing your submissions. So it's important to follow ICH guidelines, but also develop your own internal set of guidelines and templates for your documents. Font should be in black. There can be exceptions to this, of course. Blue should generally only be used to indicate a hyperlink within your document. You don't want to confuse your evaluator by making text blue and they try to click on it and it, nothing happens. Preferably, um, your document should be generated from a Word document. Now, this is not always possible, particularly with some manufacturing conformity data. In those instances, you may have to have scanned the PDF from an original document. At this point, it's important to, uh, using Adobe, to make the text as searchable as possible and try to clean up scan versions so that they're um, as easy as possible to read. Now the ICH does actually have some uh, rules around what your PDF should actually look like, and most regional specifications will also have some guidance in them about what they expect to see within your documents. Bookmarks are used to navigate as a navigational aid within the document. These bookmarks usually refer to your header sections, and when clicked on, should take you to that corresponding section. If you are having bookmarks, it's important to actually set the properties of your PDF so the bookmark pane actually opens when the PDF is opened. The general rule is that bookmarks should generally be added um, whenever the section headers. The other thing that can be considered is a table of contents that's hyperlinked at the very start of your submission document. This hyperlinking can really assist your evaluator with evaluating your documents and navigation. The general rules are that if your document is over five pages, it should probably have a table of contents. If you have style guides that you've developed, a lot of these features such as a hyperlinked table of contents and bookmarks can be automatically generated using the styles if you've been consistently applied in your Word document. This is probably one of the most beneficial aspects when authoring your documents. There's two types of document hyperlinking that can aid your evaluation. There's your intra-document hyperlinking. This is when you're referring to something that's in the document you're currently reading. So this might be to a table that's a couple of pages away or to a section. The most important type of hyperlinks though, well, in my opinion, is your external hyperlinking. This is where you have the ability to hyperlink to another document in your submission sequence, or, and even better, to hyperlink to previously submitted information. This really takes away that need to resubmit information over and over again. It's particularly helpful with response to questions because you can very specifically point the evaluator back to a particular figure or table or report that you feel addresses those questions. It is a little bit of a joke that metadata is data about data. It's structural in nature, so it helps organise the information within your dossier by utilising identifying of grouping and dividing of data and helping with the location of information. It is a tool that helps both yourselves but also the agency with navigating your dossier. I'm going to show you with you a few examples of what metadata actually looks like within the XML. 
So for each region, they will have something called an envelope at the top of their regional module one table of contents. There, there is an exceptions along the way, but generally speaking, this envelope contains product and submission specific metadata. It's telling the agency who is submitting this information, the e-identifier, submission number, the name of the product, the type of change or variation that they're submitting, and the sequence that they're submitting. Different regions will require different combinations of information. Some will require a contact email address um, so that they know who to contact about the submission. I like to think of it as the label you would put on a box that you're sending overseas. It's just got extra information about what's in that parcel and who's sending the parcel. It's a good way to think about it. It's sort of labelling what's in that sequence. Most of this is region specific. So this is where the agency will put a lot of work in to determine what information they require on their envelope and the naming and a um, standardisation of application types so that there's uh, it's not necessarily free text. So it allows them to then do a lot of grouping and uh, administrative activities using this information. There's quite a lot of metadata in the quality, that's the M2, 3 and module 3 section. It's a little bit of a repetitive piece of metadata. It's generally identifying your drug substance and your drug product. Now, it is possible sometimes to submit, have a dossier that has two drug products. This helps the evaluator to see that there's going to be two separate arms of your 3-2-P, one for one of your drug products and one for the second drug product. And that allows you to group your CTD information to each of those drug product sections. It allows the evaluator and yourselves just to make sure that you are lifecycling, updating the appropriate content to the appropriate drug product. In the clinical area, the key information that we use here for metadata is around your indication. As you would be aware, a number of your drugs that you're registering refer to more than one indication. By using some metadata here, you're allowed to have two separate 5.35 sections. This allows you to group your clinical information to a specific indication. This makes it easier. You know, some dossiers are so large that the more you can use this metadata to group things together, it makes it much easier for everyone to navigate your submission in the long term. And as a reminder, the metadata is the green text on screen. There is technically some metadata in Module 4, but it doesn't actually display on the XML. Um, it's usually entered by your publishing team based on advice from the non-clinical team. This is one of the key topics for ECTD and the key benefits of ECTD. For non-ECTD submissions, these are silos of information submitted to the agency. So if you look at this, and I hope my diagram helps with this concept, there's a number of trees there representing individual submissions. For each tree, there's been documents or leaves submitted. If you are just looking at submission one, you can only access one of those leaves, two, only those two, three and four. There's no ability to effectively reference back to that previously submitted information. An ECTD submission is an evolving entity that grows with each sequence that you submit. So over time, effectively, your tree, dossier, is fully populated with all the information you've provided. 
This allows using certain tools and using life cycling to very easily review everything that you've ever submitted to the agency. It also allows you to very quickly reference previously submitted information. This is one of the big benefits of ECTD. It allows both the agency and the company to have a clear picture of what their currently submitted and approved dossier is at any one point in time. So if you think back to the XML, I talked about some text that was in red at the end of each hyperlinked document. This is the lifecycle operation. So for each document, they must have an assigned operation. Most documents, particularly on your first sequence, will be new. These are um, the first time this leaf or document has been submitted for this product. Replace is used to replace a previous version of a leaf with a new version. So this is where you're telling the agency that that previous version no longer applies and you're submitting this new version of the information for evaluation and, and approval. Delete is when you want to hide from view a leaf document that is no longer relevant to the review uh, or was submitted in error. A good example of when you may use delete, um, probably the, it's an extreme example, but uh, imagine that you've been manufacturing your drug product at two different manufacturing sites and in your submission you have a lot of information referring to manufacturer A and manufacturer B. But then at some point you stop using manufacturer A. It may be appropriate to go through your dossier and remove those pages referencing the module of the manufacturer A to make it clear that that is no longer a site that you're maintaining or utilising for your drug product manufacture. And then your agency should only be referring to what is contained in those pages referencing your second manufacturer B. There is technically a fourth operator, append. It's not commonly used across the various regions and, it, and is likely to probably be phased out potentially in the future. So I won't touch on it too much. We had an excellent description of granularity previously to me talking, so I won't go into too much detail, but just to reaffirm, there is the opportunity, according to ICH guidelines, to sometimes decide whether you're going to submit one document or multiple documents in a section. And thought needs to be given to the level of granularity of a document within a product as this can affect your life cycling management of the ECTD. So I wanted to give this perhaps a more practical application for you. So I've got two examples there of a 3-2-P-2 um, pharmaceutical development section. So on one side you can see there's about six documents and on the other there's, I think there's about nine or 12. On the less granular side, there's less documents which can seem attractive at first glance. Less documents, less documents I have to get reviewed, less documents I have to think about. More granularity is more documents and at first glance that may appear to be a lot more work. However, let's consider if you need to make a change. If you have a 100-page document covering very many different topics and you only need to make one small change to that document, you still need to send that whole 100 pages back round for your internal review. It needs to be republished, re-hyperlinked, submitted in your ECTD, and then your agency still then needs to review that 100 pages, even though technically you might have only changed content on one or two of those pages. If you took that same document and you'd broken it down into 10 separate single documents, that process becomes a lot quicker 
you're dealing with a 10-page document, you internally only have to read those 10 pages. The agency then only has to evaluate those 10 pages again. So it's important to remember that when you're talking about granularity, if you update a document you have already submitted, you must resubmit all of that information again. You can't just cherry pick out a section, update that one section, and replace that whole previous larger document with your smaller updated section. I've had the experience where we realised that we had a document that was too big. It was covering about 12 different methods. It was about 200 pages. And we constantly needed to make small changes to it. So what we actually did was we took that large document and we actually split it into its various sections. And then very carefully, and with much detail in our cover letter, we actually replaced the old original document and added all the new granular versions and made it clear to the agency what was new for evaluation purposes and what was purely being reformatted to make it more granular. So there is the opportunity to fix things if you feel your granularity is inappropriate. So we were talking about specifications, this set of rules that governs everything that's done with your ECTD, your file names, your folder names, your um, size of your documents, whether a document has bookmarks, but the bookmark pane isn't displaying when it first opens, whether you've created hyperlinking that's broken, as in it's not correctly referencing to its source that's intended. Each ECTD is required to be evaluated against that set of rules and it's required to pass that technical validation by the local regulatory agency. Now, that will check it against your country specifications and the ICH specifications. There's a number of validation tools available. Some are free and some are licensed and there are benefits to why you would want a licensed version. Best practice, and I suspect someone in the room will be pleased to see me say this, best practice is to use the same validator as your agencies. This means that you know you're getting the same consistent report and response to the validator and you know that you're seeing the same information as the agency. When you run your validation, uh, when taking a step back, when your region and the ICH determines its set of rules, specifications, they classify those rules into three sort of buckets. One being errors, if it's not followed. One being a warning, if that rule or criteria isn't followed. And one being sort of information purposes. Now, if your ECTD is not technically valid and you've received an error, you will not be able to submit to your agency. These will need to be rectified or fixed prior to submission. The next category of validation error is warnings. Now, warnings it means that this is a highly recommended rule or specification that you should be following. Some agencies will not accept any warnings, while other agencies will accept them. They would like you still to do your best to fix them prior to sending it in. However, if it's unreasonable to make the change for whatever reason, you can submit, but you often will be asked to identify the warning in your cover letter and explain why the warning is present. The last information bucket that they will classify their rules doesn't necessarily have an impact on your ability to submit. Sometimes it's designed to, to almost prompt you to consider, have you actually included everything that we, the agency, would consider as appropriate for this submission? Sometimes it's used by the agency to gather information on their side of it for validation purposes. 
It doesn't have any impact on your submission, so you can submit with these types of information findings. The ones you really don't want to see when you're validating as a publisher is something in red. That's when you've got a problem. I'm just going to touch on a normal standard ECHD implementation process flow. This is a general approach, so please don't think that I'm being prescriptive or telling anyone how this should happen. And I'm talking a bit more from the industry perspective than the agency. So traditionally, a national agency will announce plans to transition to ECTD. This allows the company time to follow, keep abreast with what the agency is thinking about implementing, and also gives them time to start looking at their internal processes to see how prepared they are for transitioning to ECTD. This is a good time to have a look at your current uh, availability of both systems and personnel, and I'll talk about that in a moment. It's also a time to think, are we publishing and submitting, well, are we submitting in CTD format appropriately? Do we have some of these skills and technology in our organisation? It might be a time to set up or nominate someone in your organisation to be the lead for ECTD. Once, traditionally, agencies tend to release draft ECTD specifications for the industry to consult on. This doesn't always happen, but it is appreciated when the opportunity is provided. Post that consultation, the agency will announce their ECTD go live dates and release their final specifications. Now, this is often when people get very excited about ECTD. And everyone thinks, as soon as that spec is released, that you'll be submitting an ECTD format the very next day. However, it takes time for the various ECTD software vendors to take those specifications and update their software for their customers. Then you need to allow time for the companies to actually update either their existing version of their software to include the new specifications for the region, or to purchase new software and actually install it into their validated IS systems. This is where there can be a small time lag that some people haven't anticipated in the overall process of ECTD. Once you've actually got software, you can then move forward with submitting your first ECT submission. This process should hopefully be quite collaborative in nature between, and it's often it's agencies and industry, sometimes vendors get forgotten in there too. Um, so it's a very important process, this and relationship that will develop with implementation of ECTD. From the time that the agency announces an intent to move to ECTD, it may take years to progress to mandatory ECTD for all license types. Again, this is an example of what we've seen from other regions, and of course regions can make their own decisions. Some health authorities will run a pilot with industry. Pilots are an excellent opportunity for both the industry who participates in the pilot or the companies and the agency to have a safe environment to learn about ECTD, to identify maybe some bugs or things that are need to change in their processes. And it's an opportunity for both parties to learn and it can really fast track that uh, opportunity to learn. Generally, the next step is an op um, optimal, optional implementation of a new product applications. And then, the, traditionally, the next step is mandatory for new product applications. If you're in the middle of this window and you have a new product, I personally would highly recommend uh, electing to do a new product into ECTD. The reasons I recommend this is that it will give you far better abilities to lifecycle in the future. You'll have your whole dossier from day one in ECTD format. So if you are in that position of optional 
um, and you have a new product and feel comfortable, I would recommend moving to ECTD. Following the mandatory um, ECTD for new product applications, it, traditionally the next step is mandatory for legacy products. And this may take some time. Um, often uh, the agency will reconsult, propose its timelines around that transition and give industry an opportunity to say how they think, whether they can meet those timelines. Um, the Australian Agency is just doing that step at the moment. They are proposing that all new applications have to be ECTD by January 1st next year. Um, and then by 2020, uh, we will be moving fully to mandatory ECTD. So that's actually, it's about the same timing as other regions. Some companies will probably feel that it's too quick. Others will be happy to make that transition. Just touching on, so that last step, so the conversion of your products that were previously submitted not in ECTD format. What normally happens, um, health authorities may require or recommend the submission of an ECTD baseline for these products. A baseline submission is the resubmission of the current versions of previously submitted and approved documents. Not, and mind the current there. It's not everything you've ever submitted. It's the most current version of those documents. That's particularly relevant with your module three. A baseline tends to be your first ECTD sequence as you move a product to ECTD, although some agencies are open to receiving them as later sequences. It shouldn't include any information that hasn't previously been submitted to the agency. You will often be asked to declare when you submit your baseline that this has previously been submitted and there are no changes to the content. An ECTD baseline can have many different forms. It could potentially include all modules. The more common is probably module one and module three, or modules one and three, plus your key clinical studies, your module uh, phase three clinical study reports. As they're the clinical study reports you're most likely to repetitively refer back to later as you do extensions of indication or you um, ex attempt to expand your label. Baselines are not necessarily mandatory, but there is a great benefit to the overall management and life cycling of your submission, particularly for module three, if you can do a baseline for module three. Now, obviously today I've talked about some quite technical things. To actually create an ECTD submission that will meet the specifications, you will require some specialised software. You're going to need some publishing software to create your XML. Technically, XMLs could be hand-coded. I have done it before. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it. I definitely get a tool to help with this process. Um, you're going to need a validator to make sure that what you're submitting is valid. And as I said, there are some free versions and then there are licensed versions. You'll need Adobe Acrobat Standard, or I would recommend Pro, although it is expensive. And you may um, need some or appreciate the use of some Adobe Acrobat plugin tools. These tools can help with doing some of those bulk activities that I was talking about. So making sure that your bookmark pane is open where you've got bookmarks, checking your hyperlinking, uh, creating talks for documents that may not have a hyperlinked talk. Um, there's a number of uh, quick tools in there that can make the processing of those PDFs much quicker. I also recommend an ECTD viewing tool, and I feel bad that I've left talking about that to late in the presentation, because I think it's actually the ECTD viewing tool is the most critical tool 
to understanding and benefiting from the life cycling of uh, ECTD submission. I'm going to show you some examples in a moment. It's also important to consider some IS considerations. Sometimes there may be some um, security issues with transferring your information to your agency. There are also, if you're going to be needing to purchase, license, um, and install a whole suite of new software, you need to engage with your IS team early in that process to make sure it's compatible with other systems that you're working on. I highly recommend partnering with IS because they will be your partner long term in ECTD. There might be times where your agency updates your specification, so you'll need support from your IS team to update your software when those new specifications are available. The ec to do viewing tool allows you to view your ec to do both the company and the agency. And that's fine to have different viewing tools between different companies and different agencies, they generally behave and provide the same benefits. The reason why it's better than just looking at your ECTD in the Internet Explorer is the ability to take different views of your submission. So you can see your cumulative view, which means that you can see every document you have ever submitted, ever, including anything you've deleted or replaced. There's a current approved dossier view. This means that you can very quickly see exactly what is approved for your dossier. You can very quickly identify what was my latest manufacturer's page that I submitted. Um, you're a new rep working on a new product. You're not familiar with your product. The viewing tool can be a very helpful thing. You can use keywords to search. Did we submit that? additional ad hoc clinical study report back in 2000 and da da da. It can really help with figuring out the nature of your submission and it really um, creates great benefits, especially that ability to very quickly identify what's your current dossier. You can also look at your submission as just a standalone sequence and just see what was submitted for that sequence. Um, I cannot undersell that ability that everyone between the agency and the companies will have that same access and view of your dossier. This really aids the evaluation process. It's both internally and externally. So I've picked a very simple example. This is a viewing tool. In this example, we're looking at our original sequence. So I've navigated to my cover letter folder and I can see the original cover letter that went with this sequence. If I change my view to look at the current view, I can suddenly see that we have additional cover letters in there. And this at this stage represents the number of sequences that I have done for this submission. So it's excellent being able to swap between these various views so that you can see everything or you can see just one specific application. I'm not going to touch too much on ECTD version 4 because I know Jared is much more of an expert on it than me. Um, but this is a future specification for ECTD and it will bring some great benefits to us, both agency and company, uh, when it is introduced in the future. So I'll leave that for Jared to talk about. In summary, I'm hoping that I've started to open um, up your thoughts around the benefits of ECTD. I know initially when agencies and countries start discussing ECTD, there can be a natural concern about additional workload, how hard it may be to generate ECTD, but the benefits definitely outweigh some of these initial concerns and some of the initial work that might go into implementation. It really provides navigation so much easier and faster with greater search functionality. It improves that ability to navigate by being able to link to previously submitted sequences and documents in those sequences. 
It's easier to view for both the company and the agency. Longer term, I will confess, there are significant time and cost reductions. Depending on how similar your submission is between regions, you can effectively publish the one module five in ICH ECTD requirements and very quickly submit that in a variety of countries. That means that your module five only has to be reviewed the once not by five different countries. There is also the ability to reuse the documents. So once that document has been published in PDF format with all the appropriate bookmarking and hyperlinking, that PDF can very easily be submitted in a variety of different countries. I hope today that I've given you a good basic understanding of ECTD do feel free to come and track me down for a chat afterwards if you have any questions. And thank you again for allowing me to speak today.